Okay, you might like to turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 16. Um, it's my privilege to, to share the word with you today. And um, I, I was sort of struggling a little bit about what do I, what do I talk about? And uh, I had something that I've, you know, I've read in the scripture somewhere where it says it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to me. Paul said that and, and it seemed to sit pretty well with me as well. And uh, I was sort of wrestling over a, a couple of thoughts that I had, but I settled on one and then it was great to me, it seemed like a great clarification when we, we had our worship. And I just got off Matthew, the list of the songs, because you've probably forgotten what you sung already. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll sing songs that we would never pray. You know, we sung, the first song we sang, Jesus, take all of me. But we all sort of want to hang on to a little bit, don't we? Um, we sung, he loves, he loves me. We said he's jealous first, like a hurricane, eh? Yeah, I've forgotten. That's why I've got to read him. Um, but he loves us. Give me Jesus. Um, because he lives, you know, God sent his son. Um, and they all seem to me to confirm what I want to speak about. And also with the gifts this morning and and usually when I'm sitting down, I actually write them down because I was actually sitting with someone else. I didn't have my notebook with me and I didn't take a note of what the gifts were. But I felt that they, they just really confirmed to me that what I was sharing with you was really something that I felt the Lord would have, us, have me to share. And I really want to speak about his glory in the church, the glory of God in the church. And I think if you listen or watch the media, and I, I, I watch the news and I watch some programs on TV, and we certainly get a picture of a world that's in one heck of a mess. There's a lot of pretty bad stuff that's going around at the moment. We, you know, we're surrounded by strife. There's a lot, of, a lot of violence. There's a lot of... I mean, bodies are being found in the bush and all that sort of thing. So there's a lot of turmoil around, there's a lot of conflict and it's not just locally but it's on a worldwide wide scale. And yet it's, it's into this messed up world that has little time, much of it has little time for church. In fact, the church or those that are actually committed to the church get ridiculed by many. And it's in that setting that Jesus makes the absolute promise that he will build his church. There's a lot of stuff going on. I'm, I'm a bit of a fan of the V8 supercars and it's, uh, I've got the videotape going at home and I'd, I'd actually rather record it than I would watch it because I can fast forward all the ads. Uh, if you watch it, you've got to suffer them. And um, so I can just flick through the bits I don't want. But... Uh, one of the things that I've really noticed yesterday as I watched some is, do, I don't know, have any of you got the same disease as me? You, you watch them? Not many. There's a couple of you. There's actually, there's actually one with, um, that's sponsored. It's obviously sponsored by a church. I don't know who's wealthy enough to do it, but it's, a, it's got Jesus all over it. And uh, it's, there's this ute that goes around that's, it's the Jesus one, there you are, Russell's seen it. And it gets very, very good media coverage, which is extremely unusual because most Christian things in the media get absolutely rubbished. If you make a stand as a Christian, the tendency is, oh, well, you're just, you're just one of those old fuddy duddies or be, and it's old hat. We don't have to believe in that stuff. So... It's, it's in the midst of all of this stuff that Jesus has said he'd build his church. And when I speak of the church, I'm, I'm not speaking about the different denominations as such, but I'm speaking about those who've surrendered their lives to Jesus and um, they want him to be Lord of their life. So in Matthew 16, verse 13, Jesus said to his disciples, 
he asked his disciples and he said, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, and others say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But Jesus said, who do you say that I am? So in, in any sales language, it's, he, really, he really identified the prospect. He homed in on me. He said, okay, that's what others are saying, but what do you say? And often you'll talk to people and they'll start generalities and it's good to, to pull them back. And Jesus did that. And he said, but, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered him and he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him and said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father who is in heaven, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. In other words, it's, not, it, it's on the realisation that Jesus is the Christ. And that's what he's building the church on. And he says, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he said, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Keys. Not many on this set. Got a few more on the other. But these keys give me access. You've all got keys. Not many of you have got a key where you can go around the side gate there and get in. I've actually got one because it's the same as a front door key. <laughs> now, you, now you know, if you've got a front door key, you can get in around the side and you get in the little shed because we've got them all keyed alike. It makes them a lot easier than having a whole heap of keys. But the point I'm saying is that if you've got the key, it gives you access. And Jesus is saying here, he says, I give you the keys of the kingdom. I've given you the keys of the kingdom so that you have access to these things and whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven and whatever is loosed and so on. So he's given us that stuff. But the fact is I can have those keys sitting in my pocket and not use them. Not much use. But it's when I use them and he's given us keys to use. Now, I not my intention today to talk about the keys, but I'm talking about an overriding principle here that he actually gives us access with these keys and we're, we're privileged to have the keys of the kingdom. Everyone doesn't have them, but we have them. And as God's people, we're not to be discouraged by what we see in the world around us. We must hold on to the promise that in spite of the many trials that we face and the difficulties that come our way, and believe you me, we do get them, the church that Jesus builds will prevail. The church is the one thing that he has promised that he will build. In Jeremiah 29 verse 11, he says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. I've said it before. As believers, we, face, we have an endless hope. Other people have a hopeless end, but we have an endless hope. That hope is based on what Jesus has done in us and for us. The New American Standard Bible says in James... Chapter 1, it says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I haven't quite come to the stage where I rejoice when things go wrong. I think Bevan's testimony was an interesting one this morning. Obviously, I'm in good territory because he hasn't reached it either. 
But the fact is God is bringing us to a place where we can actually rejoice knowing that he has an overall plan for us. In um, Psalm 31 verse 24 it says, Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who hope in the Lord. Now that word hope has at the root of its meaning, it, it's, it's a word that really it gives us the ability to stay the course or to go the distance. So when we have hope, it's a hope that sort of works almost like a, a, bit, of a bit of an anchor. It, it keeps us grounded and stops us going off track. Psychologists tell us that a person can actually endure almost anything if they have hope. And so we face a world, a lot of the troubles in the world today, people see no hope. We have a young generation coming through that a lot of them see no hope for the future. Consequently, we end up with a lot of suicides and a lot of other stuff. Now, I'm not saying that's the only reason for them, but I think it's a contributing factor that they don't have a sense of a, of a hope or a, or a destiny. The fact that we all have a vital part to play in what God is doing because the church is not the organisation. You know, we say, oh, well, I'm going to church on Sunday. Yeah, we're coming together and we're gathering together as a people, but the church is the called out assembly. The church is you and I. We're the church. You'll notice when Rob gets up and does choruses, normally he'll get up and he'll say, good morning, church. He's not saying good day to the building. He's saying good day to us, good day to us as people because we are the church that's us and so this hope our hope comes from a deep trusting God and his unchangeable word our hope is not not frustrated by repeated difficulties and setbacks and and Lord knows we we get plenty I um happened I can't remember yeah well Peter rang me the other week and he'd had a problem with his with his work vehicle. He, he, had a, he had a difficulty. It comes our way. We all have it, especially we get those, I think the Old Testament, like, remember they had the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites? We get the Billites, don't we? Those letters with the little windows in them. And they come our way and we have to do what we have to do to get rid of them so they don't come back again with extra charges on them. But we all have plenty of difficulties that we have to face. Our hope opens a door when despair closes it. Our hope discovers what can be done instead of grumbling about what can't be done. Our hope moves us to push ahead when it would be easier to quit. And who's had those times when you felt like quitting? It's often amazed me... um, you know, people start out and they start walking with God and, and then things get tough and they go back to the way they were. And I think back, the word backslide, it, it really is a good word because why would you want to go back to what you were? I, I've never been able to work that out. It's something that I've, fortunately, by God's grace, I haven't done. But I have no desire to go back to what I was before I knew him because he turned my life around. It was like I lived in a black and white world and now I live in a coloured world. And it's, uh, does it mean I don't have any problems now? No, I still have problems. But he is the answer. So my hope moves in me. It moves me to keep going ahead and when it would be easy to quit. And my hope also sees the present problems in a crooked and perverse world as opportunities for the church to rise up and be the glorious church that it's called to be. Now, I'm not saying anything new here, but I think it's, it's good that we're reminded about these things because there are so many things out there that are trying to depress us and push us down. Ephesians 5.25 says this, it says, Christ 
loved the church. That's you and me. Christ loved us. And he gave himself for the church that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blame. That gives me a great confidence because there are things in my life you may not notice them but I notice them and I see them as little blemishes and spots and I know that he is going to fix them because he who's begun a good work in me will continue to perform it right until the day he comes back. That gives me an enormous confidence and it gives, it's a real anchor point knowing that he will not give up on me and so he will not give up on you either. Matthew already knows that. So the church may well seem irrelevant to many and it certainly may have to change. We may have to change in the way we do some things but I believe the words of Jesus that the church will prevail. In Matthew 16, 18, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. In the Amplified Bible it says this, it says the gates of Hades, the power of the internal forces, infernal forces rather, shall not overpower us or be strong to its detriment or hold out against it. Those forces, those dark forces that we face, they won't overcome. In Numbers 14, he says, As truly as I live, all the earth, shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Our hope is that in spite of our failings and shortcomings, our generation, I believe, will see the promise of God come to pass because it's his church. I believe that we will see manifestations of his glory come to pass. Look at the, look at the words of the prophet Isaiah in 50, chapter 59. He says, as for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. This is his covenant with his people. Are we his people? Yeah, we are. This is a covenant he made with his people. He said, my spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth nor from the mouth of your descendants says the Lord from this time and forevermore that's a promise that I believe we can we can take it up and be assured that he will do what he says he will do in chapter 60 it says I arise shine for the light for your light has come the glory of the Lord is risen upon you for behold the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. He speaks there of how the world being in darkness. But he says there's a glory that is going to be seen upon you. Now, I think that word glory is an interesting word. We, I don't know what you think of when you think of glory. But in the Hebrew language it actually takes six words to describe glory and we do it with one word and the six Hebrew words for glory are one of them is and I'm not sure about the pronunciations if I've got them right but Hader H-A-D-E-R and it means beautiful excellent or majestic so the glory of the Lord the, the beauty the excellence the majesty of the Lord is encompassed in that word. There is toha, T-O-H-A-R, purity, transparent. The purity and transparency of the Lord is also is encompassed in that word. There's sebi, S-E-B-H-I, and it speaks of that which is prominent and conspicuous. So this glory of the Lord, it's a, it's a prominent thing. It's something that... that 
shines forth. It's conspicuous, it's evident. There's Adareth, A-double-D-E-R-E-T-H, broad and expanding, limitless, able to go beyond natural realms. There's Koda, K-O-D-H, the grandeur. It's awesome, spectacular. We often hear the words, oh God, you're awesome. And that's a part of his glory, his, his awesomeness, if that's a good word. He's spectacular. And there's, there's Kabod, K-A-B-O-D. I should have had an overhead for you. And it speaks of something that's weighty or noteworthy, impressive, to have a spreading influence like a king with wealth and authority. So the glory of the Lord, it's, it's all encompassed. And this is, this is what he's speaking about with the church, that our lives are going to be something that is, that is beautiful. There's, a, there's an excellence about it. There's a purity. There's a transparency in us. There's a, there's a prominence. We're, we're evident. We, in other words, we stand out. Now, we, we know we're, we're like a city on a hill, like lights on a, on a hill. We're like beacons. And it's how, light, how much light is in us is what it shines out from us. The more that's in us, the more will be seen Outside, it speaks of this um, able to go beyond natural means, the, the limitless, broad, and expanding aspect of this glory, the awesomeness and the uh, spreading influence and the authority that is that this is what God is actually building up. It's in, it was interesting to hear those, those words today that are encouraging words for us. The songs that we've sung, they're they're songs that really, they really amplify the aspects of our Christian life, not just for here, but in the world. God is committed to making his church strong and healthy. That's his commitment to us. He's promised that. Now we can look around and we can think, oh, often things don't go as we want them to go. But that doesn't mean that God is not at work. When things don't go well, God is still in the midst of it. I remember some 18, nearly 19 years ago now, we got a phone call one Saturday, night, Saturday morning from, I think it was from Neville. Elaine had been taken into hospital. And she was having a, a very premature birth and there'd been some things that were going wrong and in a lot of ways our world really started to fall around us because we'd never experienced anything like that and because when she was born she was still born and they spent a lot of time getting her going again and um, consequently as you know there was a lot of she suffered a lot of brain damage and and that's had its physical outworkings. But it was really hard to get a hold of the, the aspect that we, we know that God wants us all healed and he wants us all whole. And I know God can just go like that, bang, and she can be as good as you or I. And yet he doesn't. Why? And I think... If we could only worship, my thought is, if we could only worship God and acknowledge God because he gives us all the good stuff, there would be something missing. It's learning how to cope with adversity. When things don't work out the way we would like them to work out or we think they should work out, does that make God any less real? And I think what it's done in me, it's given me a, a dimension in my walk in God through an adversity that I don't know as I could have got it any other way. Do I have all the answers? No, I still don't have all the answers. But I do have in my heart the one who is the answer. And I think that's really the key. He said, you know, when I return, Jesus said, will I find faith? 
Will I find people believing? Now, it's easy to believe when you can see it, when you can touch it, when you can smell it, and when you can taste it. But when you're holding on to something that you can't quite see and you can't quite get a hold of it, that's a different thing. And that's when our faith is not to waver. We're to stand strong knowing that over all of this, in spite of, in spite of that broken marriage that you've been through, in spite of of the loss of a loved one that you've had in spite of an illness that you can't get on top of, in spite of all that, he's still there with you and he loves you and he cares for you. And he's shaping you to be a glorious image that other people are going to see and they're going to look to you and say, what is it that stops you from falling? Why don't you go out and find a tree and bloom and hang yourself up on it? Because I've got this everlasting hope. That's why. And there's a joy that's not determined by my situation. And as Paul could say, when he was in prison, he said, I've learned to rejoice no matter what situation I'm in, whether I'm bound or in chains or wherever I am. I can still rejoice in you and that's the place that God is wanting to bring us into as he continues to work through us I believe that the church in these last days is becoming a people of increasing influence and power and I think the day is coming when the world is going to look to us because they're finding that they don't have the answers And we're becoming a people of increasing influence and power and we're going to be a people who can really move other people into a living hope in God because of the glory that is actually in us as his church. We're living in a period of amazing technical innovation as well as unprecedented political, economic and cultural changes. I think the... The very fact that, you know, when I'm, when I'm away for a while and even as Bevan was away for a while, he can get on the internet and he can, he can still get the messages from the church here thanks to, to Paul and his expertise. He can get them on the internet. Anyone can hear them and you can go back and you can think, oh, what did so-and-so preach on last time? You can go back and you can hear it. Marvellous technology. Ahead of us, I think we face... Probably some, some new pressures and difficulties, things that we haven't faced before. But I think the church has never looked better or been better equipped because we're destined to fulfil our God's given purpose. I want to close with Ephesians chapter 3 where Paul said, For this reason... I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through the spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. What a prayer. And I think that would be his prayer for us today, that we would come to understand some of the riches that we have as our inheritance in him.